Would you join me in prayer? Wondrous God, we give you thanks that we can gather together to hear your word and to experience your presence. May the words that we hear be the words you would have us hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I have a word of advice to offer anyone who is staying in a home not your own. If you're walking through the house at night, be sure to turn on the lights. I learned this lesson the hard way in, during my trip to Oregon in October. You may have heard about this. I, I was staying with some friends in Portland. It was the first night of a week-long trip to, to see friends and family. And since I needed to take a pill before I went to bed, and therefore I needed a glass of water, I followed Mark to the kitchen to get that glass of water in the dark. Unfortunately, I forgot that there are stairs that go down into the kitchen. So I took my step into the kitchen, and I missed the first step. And before I knew it, I was laying on the floor on my back with a very sore ankle. Yes, I twisted my ankle so badly that it swelled up and it turned black and blue and it was painful. But it didn't stop me from pushing on with my trip, sore ankle and all, because I had people to see and places to go. Nevertheless, if we had turned on the light, none of this would have happened. When it comes to walking in darkness, make sure you turn on the light, or at least have a flashlight. It might save you from stumbling and falling and twisting your ankle. That's my word of advice. Now to Epiphany. You might say that during the season of Epiphany, God turns on the light that shines into the darkness. We've already heard Second Isaiah speak on two occasions in the last two Sundays about Israel being a light to the nations. In Isaiah 42, God says through the prophet, I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people a light to the nations to open the eyes that are blind to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. And then in Isaiah 49, God says to Israel, I will make you a light to the nations that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. This word may have been given first to Israel, but as followers of Jesus who have been grafted by God's grace in Christ into the vine that is Israel, the same commission to be light to the nations has been given to us. We too are called to be agents of God's salvation in the world. Our disciples' identity statement makes it clear we are called to be a movement of fullness in a fragmented world. This morning we've heard a word from the prophet Isaiah who lived in the 8th century BCE. This word follows two words that were given through a 6th century prophet to exiles living in Babylon. In this morning's reason, we move back nearly two centuries to the 8th century. The people who received this word aren't living in exile, but they, they're surrounded by enemies. They are experiencing darkness. From their more, which is their more powerful neighbors, which includes the northern neighbor Israel, just to their north. In the 8th century, Israel will disappear. They'll fall to the Assyrians, but that didn't change the situation for Judah. They still lived in a context of unfriendly neighbors. And so the word here is that they walked in darkness, but they would see a great light. 
Yes, the prophet offers them the promise of liberation from their enemies. They will experience joy. Think about that for a minute. They will experience joy because the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. Day of Midian refers to a battle that happened many years before that freed uh, Israel from its neighbor's grip. This morning we return to a portion of scripture that we last visited on Christmas Eve, if you remember. On Christmas Eve we heard the prophet declare in the verses that follow that, didn't, that weren't read this morning, but ones that we know probably for a child has been born for us. A son has been given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You may also know some of these words from the Messiah, including the chorus that I have sung in the past. While we don't know exactly who the promised child might have been, there's all kinds of discussion about that, whatever the identity of the child, the birth of the child would serve as a sign of God's presence with the people. I'm just riffing off, my, off things this morning, but you know, I wonder, is Lydia a sign of God's presence in our midst? Think about that for a moment. The gospel writers don't draw directly from this particular declaration about the child who is the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. But Christians have been looking at Jesus through the lens of this passage for centuries after all, the Gospel of Matthew follows Isaiah in declaring this promised child to be Emmanuel. God is with us. As we progress through the season of Epiphany, the season of light, we're reminded that in Jesus, the liberating power of God is on display. We hear the word that Jesus is the light that shines in the darkness. We visit Isaiah 9 this morning in the company who draws on the opening lines of Isaiah 9 to describe the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Matthew tells us that after John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus left Nazareth and went to Capernaum in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. And when he arrived to the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, in fulfillment of Isaiah's word, he began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. According to Matthew, Jesus picked up Isaiah's message of liberation and began to reveal the nature of God's realm. He proclaimed the message of God's realm by inviting us to enter in and experience the light that God shines into the darkness, bringing freedom to our lives. Martin Luther King Jr., whose memory, whose birth we remembered earlier this week, spoke in 1963 that darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. When the light drives out the darkness, freeing us from our bondage to the darkness, we can rejoice and be glad, and we can celebrate the good news. And we know the truth, that freedom leads to celebration. Every 4th of July, we celebrate Independence Day with parades, picnics, and fireworks. The Jews celebrate Passover in remembrance of their liberation from slavery in Egypt. So whenever liberation occurs, in whatever form it occurs, there is a cause for celebration. 
the psalm, if we were to read the psalm today, that comes from Psalm 27, which opens with the words, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Even when it come, seems as if darkness is closing in on us, creating confusion and disorder, we can take hold of the light that sets us free from fear. Unfortunately, we live at a time when there seems to be an epidemic of what Charlie Brown's counselor Lucy Van Pelt called pantophobia. Remember that? Pantophobia, the fear of everything. Apparently, the light of the Lord is the best vaccine against this threat. Last Monday evening, I attended the Know Your Neighbor Martin Luther King event at the Troy Police Department. It was sponsored by the Troy Area Interfaith Group, the Troy, Alliance, Troy Area Alliance Against Hate Crimes. That's a lot to say, but it's important. The Troy Library and the Troy Police Department. This event reminded us that fear can be dangerous. It can lead to violence against people who seem to be different. We watched a film that explored several hate crimes that took place in Northern California some 15 to 20 years ago. These included arson attacks against three synagogues in Sacramento, the murder of a gay couple who were pillars of their community in Redding and further north, and the murder of a transgender teen in Newark, California, as well as a cross burning on an African American woman's yard in Anderson, California. The film not only explored these acts of violence that were rooted in fear, but they noted they all took place under the cover of darkness. The good news, in all of the bad news, is that these communities came together and responded to these acts of violence with acts of light. They gathered as a community to respond to these acts of violence, these acts of darkness. Well, after the event concluded, I had a conversation with some of my friends, and, and the question came up as to whether there has to be an act of violence or an act of hate before the community acts. In other words, why are we always reacting to acts of darkness rather than being proactive? It's a good question. Do we only rally to the defense of our neighbors when they've been attacked? Or can we stand up for what is right beforehand? Can we be harbingers of light before darkness ever takes hold? And if so, how do we do this? Community efforts like TIG, Know Your Neighbor, they're expressions of light in the city of Troy. But you know, our numbers are few. There may have been 30 or 40 of us, maybe 50 of us gathered at that event on Monday night. But Troy is a city of over 80,000 people. So how do we expand the base? That's the question. As we consider the question of how do we expand the base so we can be proactive and rather than always being reactive, we're again reminded by the psalmist that the Lord is my light and my help. That's a different translation. The Lord is my light and my help. Whom shall I fear? If the Lord is our light as followers of Jesus, how and where can we be agents of light as we go about our daily lives? How might we live in hope and not fear so that the world around us can experience the joy that comes through the reign of God as it is experienced on earth as well as in heaven. So let the light of the Lord shine and let the celebration of our freedom begin. <laughs>